Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, my name is Alan Logue. I'm the MSYP for the Western Isles. I use she, they pronouns, and I have long dark hair, and I'm wearing a dark skirt and a black and white, uh, dark top and a black and white skirt. And I would like to welcome you all to the 2024 Festival of Politics. Uh, this year celebrates the festival's 20th year of provoking, inspiring, and informing people of all ages from every walk of life to engage in five days of spirited debate. I look forward to the discussion and hearing from everyone's. Uh, hearing from everyone's thoughts and views. It is important that everyone is given the opportunity to contribute, even where there may be differences in opinion, and that we treat each other with respect at all times. I would also like to take some time to acknowledge that some of the topics that may come up in the panel might be difficult. We encourage you to look after yourself, and if you need uh, time in the next hour and a half, um, if you need time in the next hour and a half, please take it. There is a quiet room just off uh, the garden lobby in a room for... Uh, contemplation. If you need to leave at any point, please do, or grab a member of staff to show you the way. We are delighted you can join us today to participate in the Sexism in the Workplace in partnership with Young Women's Movement and the Scottish, Parliament, uh, Scottish Youth Parliament, and Lisa and I will be inviting you to get involved with some questions and comments. If you're keen to throw your thoughts out there, you can do so by using at Visit Scott Parle on Instagram. I would also like to add that this event will be able to view in a fortnight's time on the, festi on the festival's website. I'm very pleased to be joined here today by Claire Ryan Dorp, well <laughs> Carolyn Cuddy, and uh, Jack Anderson, MSYP. Uh, Claire Ryan Dorp is the chief executive of the Young Women's Trust, the leading organisation championing young women aged 18 to 30 on low or no pay. Claire has 25, experience, 25 years worth of experience in the third sector, delivering high impact programmes and services with and emphasis on tackling inequalities. Jack Anderson is the MSYP for Dundee City East and the Chair of Dundee Youth Council. Uh, in July 2023, he successfully passed a motion at the SYP national sitting calling for greater protection for young people working in retail and hospitality sector sectors, receiving support from 94% of the SYP membership. And uh, Carolyn Curry is the Chief Executive of the Women's Enterprise Scotland and has guided the development of global leading standards for women's business support. Prior to this, she was the Head of Women in Business at RBS, where she was the first woman to manage the bank's multi-million pound business leading book. There will be opportunity for the members of the audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. However, if I may start, I would like to open uh, by asking each of our panellists, um, do you think that women in the workplace have a level playing field? And I'll just go along like that. Hi everybody, um, it's lovely to be here. Um, as uh, Alana's just said, I'm Chief Executive of the Young Women's Trust and we champion young women in the workplace, particularly young women on lower incomes. And we focus on England and Wales, uh, but we're a sister organisation to, yeah, can you hear me okay everybody? Yeah, a uh, sister organisation to the Young Women's Movement uh, in Scotland. So uh, it's fab to be with you. We've done research um, with uh, young women and young men in, the, in England and Wales and we found that 50% um, of young women have experienced discrimination in the workplace. So the short answer to your question about whether there's a level playing field for me would be no. Um, and we also surveyed managers in companies um, and we found that a third of them confirmed that they thought there was sexist behaviour in their workplace. Um, and shockingly, 15% um, thought that men were more suited to senior management jobs than women, which is a kind of sort of sexist attitude that you thought might have died with the dinosaurs. Um, but they're still alive and well, uh, at least from this evidence from England and Wales. And that, um, and that discrimination in the workplace is, means that alongside the sort of sectors that young women are working with and the unpaid care they're doing outside of work, means they're taking home across the UK one-fifth less than young men um, per year, about £4,000 per year less. Um, and, that, and that income inequality grows through the course of their lives, which I know there's a lot of young women in the audience here. There is going to be some good news in this session today. But that grows to um, a big pensions gap when women are uh, older in their later life. So getting equality right in the workplace is absolutely, absolutely key, and we haven't got it yet. Hi everyone, I'm Jack Anderson and I'm the MSYP for Dundee City East. Totally agree with you on that question, Claire, about the being a level playing field. And some of the statistics you've just shared are completely shocking. It just yeah. feels like they're um, historic, but still alive and well. Um, 
In anticipation of coming along here today, I've spoken to friends, family and colleagues about their experience, and I'm in no doubt there isn't a level playing field for women in the workplace. Whether it's particular industry still being dominated by men, men finding it easier to progress into management or leadership positions, or the gender pay gap that's still in place. I think that just shows the broad range of um, inequality that still exists. And I think it's true as well that there's particular industries or professions and areas of the country as well where these imbalances are more acute than others. Hi, I'm Carrie, or Carolyn Curry. Everybody calls me Carrie. Um, Chief Exec of Women's Enterprise Scotland. So in our work, we help um, women to start up their own business and to, to grow that business, to be their own boss, effectively. Um, and we were recently um, celebrating, more research had come out that says, um, actually, there are equal numbers of men and women starting up in business. But there's a bit of a story behind that, because part of that equality, part of that parity that's been achieved in terms of business start-up numbers are increasing numbers of women leaving the workplace because of poor workplace cultures or because of a sense that actually um, they could take their talents, start up their own business and succeed on their own terms instead of succeeding um, on somebody else's terms. So, you know, do I still think that sexism <laughs> exists in the workplace for, for some women? Yes, absolutely it does. We hear that ourselves in terms of why women are coming out and using their skills and talents to set up their own businesses. But also we hear that from women and from men who are motivated to make a difference. So they are coming out and they're setting up initiatives that they think will make a real difference to all these cultural reasons that, you know, we are still sitting here today on a panel talking about workplace culture and sexism. So, you know, there is a, a lot of good work, I think, coming, coming out of this. But fundamentally, let's not kid ourselves, it might be 2024, but that culture of sexism is 100% still there today. Thank you very much. Um, so I've got another question for you. So we've already kind of answered, like, the why do you, why do you think that there's not a level playing field between men and women? And what do you think needs to change to give all women a level playing field? So we'll go from Carrie first and we'll go back down. <laughs> uh, why, why does it still exist? Well, I think by definition it's, it's still going on today, isn't it? We've been talking about it for a long, long time. It's a complex issue, so that, that's part of it. We shouldn't just think, you know, we can change it like that. It's, it's a cultural thing and, and cultures are really difficult to change. You know, we are talking about a workplace culture that has had a gender dynamic of majority men for centuries. And we are seeking to change that culture, which is really quite deeply embedded. So while in many ways it's simplistic to go, but we should all be equal, we should all be equal. Of course we should all be equal. Why can't we just change that? Well, history will tell us it's complex and it's difficult and it's multifaceted. Um, so that is why it is still there and we're, we're still talking about it. But that doesn't mean that it can't change. It doesn't mean that perhaps some of you here today will be the catalyst for that change. And that's definitely part of my hope for the future because we are seeing a lot more people who are aware of the issue of sexism in the workplace. There are plenty of case studies, plenty of experiences. And the Me Too movement in recent years has really put a lot of this into a sharp spotlight. So people are well informed. We are hearing from men that want to lead change, from men that want to make a difference, and from women that are frankly just sick fed up of working in that environment. And you know, we need to be aware that both men and women when they see something unpleasant in the workplace, will vote with their feet. You don't necessarily have to be the target of the unpleasantness. It is deeply unpleasant watching something that is unacceptable and unpleasant happening in your workplace. So people will leave. So workplaces themselves, you know, have got a really sound motivator to get to grips with cultural change and to make a difference. Um, 
So yeah, in terms of what needs to change, that culture piece needs to change. But the other part that's really important to remember that in workplaces, workplaces are mostly there to make a difference or, or to, to make a profit. And actually innovative thinking happens when men and women come together with their different experiences, share those and capitalise on those. You know, I'm a banker to trade, so I can tell you commercial success is driven by diverse experiences and diverse thinking. It is not driven by groupthink. So it's important to remember that, that there's actually a very important commercial aim behind it, or if you're working in the sort of not-for-profit sector, there's an important, you know, achieving your vision, you do that by innovating. And innovating happens when you bring different perspectives to bear. Thank you very much. Um, I totally agree with you. There definitely does need to be a culture shift um, within the workplace, 100%. Um, Jack, do you want to go on? Yeah. So I think looking at it from the point of view of someone who's just left school and my peers and friends um, are in a similar position, I think something that really affects young people is a lack of positive role models, um, particularly in industries and sectors that are dominated by men. So I know speaking to friends, they'll talk about um, I had one who did work experience this summer and she'd come out of it saying, oh, I wouldn't want to work for that company in the senior leadership positions. It was just men and it completely put her off. And I think that's an experience and it's off-putting for young women and girls entering the, the industry, seeing that and it is putting them off. So I think we do need to absolutely do more to encourage and promote um, these positive role models to young people in schools so that they are able to see it and see a route for them in that industry, particularly things like construction, manufacturing, law, that are typically dominated by men. We do need to show that there are women in these industries and sectors and you can make a good and enjoyable career out of it. And I think it's a similar thing as well for other minorities as well, whether it's LGBT or BAME, it's a similar thing in these industries where they don't feel represented, they can't see themselves in the workforce and it does put them off entering it, particularly at our level where we are thinking about a uh, university, college, course, apprenticeships. It is, when you're looking at all the options, it can be really off-putting. Yeah, I really enjoyed um, your bit about there, about um, positive role models. Like, um, it took me to like a very similar experience. My 17-year-old uh, sister is an apprentice joiner, so she's on her third year at apprentice joinery and she loves it, but she's a very, very headstrong woman. One of the strongest women I think I will ever meet in my life. Um, but it's, there needs to be more people out there like her or like her like peers that can kind of give you that, that can, that can show young women that they can go into construction or they can go into manufac manufacturing for definite. Yeah, I mean, just to build on that, like, you know, quite a lot of really good big companies have got fantastic early careers offers in terms of reasons to be cheerful after quite a bleak opening for me in terms of those figures. <laughs> You know, there are great companies out there who've got dedicated early careers teams that are really focusing on like imaginative apprenticeships and ways of welcoming young people and, and particularly young women, young working class people, young people of colour into the workplace and, and, and giving them the active mentoring and sponsorship that they deserve and, and need to get ahead. So that is absolutely more of that. And obviously um, big companies can afford to do that. Sometimes it's more challenging for smaller organisations. There's also, um, companies are changing their practice. One of the things that is driving the inequality in pay between young men and young women is things like asking salary history questions. So when you start a job and someone gives you a job offer, they say, well, what were you getting in your last job? And if women are getting lower pay than men, they take that lower salary to their next job. And, and what we've seen in, in a lot of American states and now in the European Union is that salary transparency has been legislated as you, you cannot ask those sort of salary history questions, they're not legal, and you must put a salary on the advert because that job is worth a particular salary. It's not about the gender, the race, or the person coming in and what they did in their last job. It's about what that job is worth. So companies are doing that increasingly. Um, we, we need to see more of it. About half the adverts in, in the UK have got salaries on them. So that's one really practical thing that we can do to kind of close gender pay gaps. The other thing, I know a lot of, of, of young people in the room here have had a pretty tough time in the pandemic. One of the good things that's come out of the pandemic is a culture of flexible working. I mean, I had a, a partner who was told that he couldn't work from home one day a fortnight. 
uh, four years ago to look after our, our kids. And now he works for a company where they frankly don't care where he's working from as long as he's doing the job, uh, which has totally changed um, our lives and will change the lives of a lot of, of young people when you go into um, having caring responsibilities or looking after younger siblings or supporting family members with, with uh, disabilities and caring responsibilities. So that's, that is definitely shifting and that is going to change, I hope, continue to change um, the kind of equality in the workplace. And the, the other thing is what you do with line managers. So line managers are kind of either champions or, or gatekeepers in people's working lives. And companies that are really working with their line managers and saying, how do you be a great line manager? 80% of people become a line manager through accident. That's the, the uh, Chartered Management Institute um, survey suggests that. And, and, and actually being a line manager, you have a lot of responsibility and power. How do you use that power? So use your power for good um, as a line manager, champion the people that you're working with, listen to what their needs are. And, and we're in the Young Women's Trust doing training for line managers about what's it like to be a young woman in the workplace and uh, how, do you, how do you be that, that, that change. So, um, and also there's a lot of male allies. It's fantastic to be on the panel with you, Jack. Sometimes I speak in all women groups with all women panel members. Um, but there are men out there who are saying in meetings, oh, I think um, the young woman over there, Alana, has just made that point. Thank you for uh, making it again. But she's just, um, she said that. Or, um, oh, I think you'll find that um, Carrie was just was speaking there um, and you've just uh, interrupted her. Carrie, would you like to carry on with what you were saying? You know, ways of making sure that um, for some um, organisations and cultures where men have got used to being able to speak their views. Um, apparently, there was just some research done that I was reading last night saying 25% of conversations in the workplace and meetings, um, um, women are speaking 25% of the time um, when they are in, in groups where they're predominantly male. And the more you get women in the workplace, the more women feel able to talk and bring their whole selves to work. Um, and I think we've got to underline again that intersectional lens as well, because this is about how you bring your whole self to work, whatever your skin colour, your, your religious identity, you know, your class, your, you know, your background, all of this is connected together. Thank you very much. Um, we're just going to move on to the third question now. So, um, imposter syndrome can, be, can cause many women to doubt their skills and abilities and to feel less confident in themselves and their roles, that, uh, and their roles than their male counterparts. Um, but there is a wealth of evidence to suggest that feel, this feeling is a result of a systematic bias and issues in the workplace. What do you think are the roots, are the roots causes of imposter syndrome and what do you need to create real systematic change within the workplace? So we'll go with... Jack, you can go first this time. <laughs> Such a bit. I think um, this is a really interesting question. And kind of um, in the lead up to this and, and thinking about it, um, it's been really interesting speaking to colleagues and hearing their experience um, with these kind of challenges. And it's possibly th things or people you wouldn't think necessarily would um, struggle with these sorts of things. But hearing um, about them was really eye opening um, in the lead up to this. And I think there was quite a few who'd spoken about, like, particularly if they've gone away to have family or possibly caring responsibilities, coming back into the workforce after possibly a period of absence and possibly having to go back and procedures have changed or they're in a new team or a new office, it can be quite nerve-wracking. They lose their confidence. And I've been speaking to mum because after she'd had me and my siblings, she'd gone back to university and retrained. And she'd said there was just such... She felt really at a place um, when she, she did that. And there was a huge stigma around it. And I just thought it's so interesting, things you possibly wouldn't really think about, but just that whole stigma around families and care responsibilities and the change that it brings and the lack of confidence that um, that kind of comes with it was so, so interesting. And I've been speaking to one of the line managers, she'd spoken about what needs to change. Um, in, I've got a part-time job in a supermarket and one of the things they're doing is they've got um, managers and they're teaming up and partnering with somebody on the shop floor who's looking to possibly progress or make a change in their career and they'll mentor them so they've got someone to talk to and possibly share experiences, worries, concerns, achievements. I think that's a really good idea, um, that one-on-one -on -one support, but kind of quite informal um, and you feel free to ask questions and things. So I think that, that's something they've just started, 
but I think that'll be really promising and I'm looking forward to seeing how that progresses. That really does sound promising and um, going back on what you were saying about your mother, um, I feel like it's especially that whole idea of um, being a woman and going away and starting a family and coming back to your job or your career or your education is incredibly daunting. And I think that's what stops a lot of, especially young women, like young mums, um, stopping stopping them from career, from advancing in their career and advancing in education. So I thought that was really good that you brought that up. Um, yeah. Carrie, do you want to go? No. Claire, sorry. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, um, a Young Women's Trust, we offer free professional coaching to 4,000 young women a year. And, uh, and they come to us as an open access service. And one of the biggest um, topics that they come for coaching with is about confidence. Um, and and the coaching really helps them with that. But obviously, as you said in your question, confidence is a political issue. There's a reason why young women are feeling, on average, less confident than young men. And right from um, a very young age, I think, as a, as a girl and as a young woman, you get messages about how you're supposed to behave, um, whether you are pushy versus ambitious, perhaps, for a young man, um, how loudly you're supposed to speak, how assertive you're allowed to be, the ways that it's being good. And I mean, I'm certainly, uh, although I had a good feminist mum, still got, grew up with a lot of like, you need to please people and, and smile and like, you know, not, not cause discomfort for others. And, and that's all inside us. And then we go into workplaces which are often dominated by, by men and um, white men and, and we may not look like that and have a different set of experiences. So if you see confidence as something around like, what has happened to you as a, as a young woman um, and, and, and make it a political thing, we, we have to go out and fight it. Of course, recognise the experience it. And me as a chief exec, I always felt like I was never going to be ready to be a chief exec and used to wake up regularly in the night still do going, oh, I can't do this, I'm not good enough. Um, and uh, it's not often talked about, is it, that feeling like, are you good enough? Um, and, and, uh, and because that's not shared, I think many young, young women and women aren't going into positions of responsibility <laughs> and power. But we have to fight that. And, and men also need to talk about what it's like sometimes to be anxious. It's not easy to sit on a platform uh, and, and have the confidence to talk. It's not something that is easy for men either, but it, it is a political issue. Um, and... Uh, I talk, I've got two girls, I talk to them all the time about it, and all my nephews, <laughs> even more importantly. Um, so, yeah, imposter syndrome, I think, partly helps as a term, but it labels it as a problem for, for us to solve, and it, it isn't, it's a collective thing. I don't like the term imposter syndrome, no. personally. I feel like it's got such a negative connotation, it makes you feel like the, you you're not supposed it. to be there and the, you can't do it. Um, I feel like lack of confidence is definitely a better way of putting things, but... That's just my personal preference. Three hundred percent. Do you know? Well, I'm having none of that, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Not imposter syndrome. And if you're feeling a lack of confidence, question why that is. Um, because actually often it is rooted in these systematic inequalities that women face every single day, every single day in your lives. You will often be made to feel not quite right, not quite fitting in. And, and the reasons are because society is not an equal place. So imposter syndrome, and sorry, imposter syndrome, it definitely exists, sadly, and for men and for women. But if you're a woman feeling an imposter, get a grip of it and stop it. You're there for a reason. You're there for a reason. And if your way of doing it is a little bit different, that's very possibly the reason why you are there in the first place, because we don't want a pack of sheep saying the same thing, looking the same thing. As we've said before, that's not good for our national innovation, our competitiveness in our economy. We want to have different thinking, different people in different roles. So do not buy in to any imposter syndrome. And it's the same with confidence. Confidence is a very personal thing. And Claire, yes, I have found myself in some situations and gone, I'll choose my words. Oh dear. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> is this really me? So we all face that. But that is part of your personal development. You know, it is part of growing. It's part of going into the workplace, developing a career. It's part of realising your own ambitions. It's not possible to do all of that without putting yourself out of your comfort zone. 
So it is part of life, um, but I think we need to be careful that our systems, our processes, our workplaces aren't causing some of those issues. We need to get a grip of that. But do not let anybody make you feel unconfident or make you feel you are an imposter. That is not applicable. Follow your dreams. Always follow your dreams. We talked earlier about role models, didn't we? Have a role model. Look at people that you would aspire to be. Look at how they've got to how they are. And be really inspired by that, by being focused on the goals that you want to achieve. And don't let anybody tell you, you cannot do it. Conversely, I'm going to see if there is not a role model in place, then I'm afraid the chances are it's going to be you. Because somebody's got to take that first step. And you might not see yourself as that person. I can 100% tell you I did not see myself as a person that was going to be, at some point in her career, the Chief Executive of Women's Enterprise Scotland. But here I am. I'm very proud to be the Chief Exec. I'm very proud that's part of my career journey. Plenty of times I've felt an imposter. I've felt, why would it be me? What makes me the person to say these things? Just get over yourselves. I'll say it right. Just get over yourself. Don't entertain those thoughts in a new role or if you have a new ambition. Get over it. It is you. You're there. Crack on. Learn from it and enjoy it. It's part of your career journey in your life and fulfilling your personal ambition. And there is nothing better than fulfilling your personal ambitions in this life. It is quite a satisfying um, <laughs> way, like, way that you put it. And it's like, I, I personally feel quite inspired. Like, obviously, um, I'm a trustee at the Scottish Youth Parliament and um, it's a very new role that I've just been elected into. And I, at the beginning, felt insane amounts of imposter syndrome. Obviously, I'm the first from the Western Isles to be a trustee on the Scottish Youth Parliament board and it's also our first all-female board which is showing great amounts of um, progression in the systematic changes in the workplace. Um, however, yeah, I do really enjoy your fact that you're just like, just do it, just do it. <laughs> because you do need somebody to just give you that push, definitely. Um, so my next question I actually have fitting um, is what have you seen to, that has been successful or un unsuccessful for systematic change in the workplace? And I'll go to yourself first, Claire. So some of the things I've been talking about before, successful things like um, salary transparency, reporting on gender pay gaps in the workplace and putting in action plans, flexible working, offering support to women coming back after a break um, for having kids, more mentorship and sponsorship. I, it's great to hear that that is happening in supermarkets. That's really inspiring. Um, what's been unsuccessful, I think, people thinking that they need to rush around and get their policies right and focus on policies rather than on culture. That goes back to what you're saying, Carrie. Um, and I think a lack of leadership in workplaces, it, it needs to be modelled at the top. And 100% uh, says Carrie. So they would be my two, two things. Definitely, Anne. Uh, Jack? Yeah, I think kind of building on what you'd said, the lack of positive leadership, I definitely think is a big one. When I was doing um, some reading ahead of coming in today, I was really shocked to see that I think in 2022, there was only nine uh, women CEOs in the FTSE 100 companies and only 12 in the FTSE 250 companies, which just seems absolutely incredible um, in this day and age. I think it shows that if you've got men in these positions, they're not really understanding the issues that women have. So if you've not got that mix of leadership at the top of the company, it's not going to come down. So that, that to me, I think is a really big problem. And I think it said on the current trajectory, it'll be 2045 until we've got equality in the boardroom, which just seems absolutely crazy. And definitely something that we need to work on to ensure that we're getting equality at the high levels um, of our businesses as well. But I think you touched on it, Alana, that in the Scottish Youth Parliament a few years ago, um, we had a male chair and vice chair, and now that we've just elected our all-female board. Um, and in the, we've got a young, a young women's empowerment group and that met in August, and the members of that had picked up on the difference it's made within the organisation to feel a woman um, leading it, and that their issues were being reflected and represented. So it is making a big difference just within our organisation alone. Definitely. Yeah, so I completely agree with all of that. 
um, and particularly that it needs to come from the top. Um, it is part of being a leader. You cannot just say things. You need to lead by example and you need to enact that in your organisation. So for all of you that aspire to be our leaders of the future, you know, really take that on board. And the statistics are appalling, actually, for the number of female chief executives. There are more women coming into the boardroom which is really important. It's really important to think about getting board expertise in your career. It's a really valuable insight. So the likes of the work that the Scottish Youth Parliament does is fantastic because it gives you that insight and understanding. Um, but yes, we need more. So, you know, hello, who wants to be a future chief executive? You know, start adding that into your aspirations and start thinking like that here today because change won't come if we all just sit back and go oh, it'll be somebody else so have a think about that and um, as you're reflecting on this session today we need more chief executives who are progressive who are going to lead change who are going to turn scotland you know into an innovative nation so i think that is really really important and what has been successful or unsuccessful? Successful leading from the front. Definitely, we've seen some great leaders, men and women, who have really championed it, who have really led it, who have importantly called out bad behaviours and done something about that. And that is part of how you change a culture. What has been unsuccessful? Well, I wouldn't say this point I'm going to make has been unsuccessful. But, you know, if we go back a decade or so, or two decades maybe, we were all talking about unconscious bias, weren't we? How people were just unconsciously biased and they were making poor decisions. And if we had better training and insight and understanding, then things would shift. And I'm just going to say, well, we've gone through that cycle now. It is, I think it's virtually impossible to be unconsciously biased about gender inequality in this day and age. I mean, it's in the media every single day, isn't it, in some shape or form. Um, so I think we need to move on from box ticking our unconscious bias training every year in the workplace and do something more progressive. People need to understand how to behave when a difficult situation rears its head in the workplace, you know, or the environment that you're in. Suddenly something is said, it is unacceptable and it's poor, but how do you react in that situation? These are the conversations we need to be having to empower people so that we are reacting appropriately and positively and in a way that will drive change. And that reaction isn't always to say, you're out of order, get out. You know, there are many flavours of that. And I think that's the problem that holds people back. What is the dialogue in that situation? So we need to work on training more people and making that culture much better. Because as I said before, people exposed to that will leave. It's not just the person subjected to poor behaviour. We know, Claire, I'm sure you'll know from your research, people will leave the workplace if that's how they see how it is. Who wants to work in that kind of toxic environment? Not many. So we need to get stuck in about that, I think, as the next point of progressive change. Definitely. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on to the next question now, which is um, how can men provide allyship to women in the workplace? And uh, I'm going to go to you, Jack, if that's OK. Yeah, that's fine. So I think um, this is a really important question. And I think there's a few things that come from it. But I think the first thing that came to me was ensuring that we're in the room for these talks. So like having men on these panels is really important, having these sorts of discussions, because change won't happen unless everyone in the workforce is invested behind it. So we need everybody to see it as a problem and everyone want to solve it as well. So it's great that there's events like this happening and businesses getting everybody around these sorts of discussions. But I think it's important as well, and it came out, I mentioned this Scottish Youth Parliament's Women Empowerment Group, the, it come out from that discussion that young women often found that young men or boys were kind of talking down to them and trying to tell them how they should feel. So I think it's important that when we're having these discussions, men in the workplace aren't trying to do that. We are listening to women and trying to understand their experiences, not tell them how we think they should feel. So I think that's, that's important. And the kind of, as I mentioned earlier, that's over the last few weeks, that's what I've been doing in my place of work, speaking to women and hearing about their experiences and things. And it's been really interesting and really eye-opening. And we've had conversations that if it wasn't for this, we wouldn't have had. So it's definitely been beneficial. 
But on a day-to-day -day role, I think it's really important that to create a work environment that's fair and kind, that if we do see something that's inappropriate or wrong, that we do call it out and we're not scared to do that. And it kind of comes back to, you'd mentioned, proper training and having the confidence to do that. So I think that's really important as well. The um, companies and employers do give us the skills and expertise to be able to call out behaviour when we think it's wrong, as that's the only way we'll get a, a fair workforce. Definitely. Thank you very much. And I'll um, go to yourself, Kelly. Oh, well, that's great timing then, isn't it? <laughs> because I'm dying to jump in. Yes. Uh, what, you know, what, what can men really do? Listen, listen, please listen. You know, I think that is the single most important thing because for all of us that want to see change, it's really easy to solutionise, isn't it? It's really easy to jump in and solutionise. But actually, please listen. Please listen. Please let women share their experiences and let women be part of the solution. Give them the legitimacy to address what they're experiencing in their own lives and the help and the support and the resources to go off and do that. That doesn't mean as a man, you're not part of the solution, you 100% are. But I think sometimes the danger is people who are keen to help jump in and solutionise. And I can tell you, I mean, I've held many uh, bits of research I've undertaken and sat in many round table events. And the most powerful thing I have ever heard from a man in a room was, was this quote, what do we know? Let the women tell us what's needed. And I honestly just about fell off my seat. Because, and, and, and not out of badness, people are there because they want to help, people come together because they want to help. But we need to hear more of that. That was a real role model moment. That was a real leadership moment. Let the people with lived experience come together and design the solutions. So I think that is critically important. So please do that. Please do that, Maine. Thank you very much. It was very insightful. I um, 100% agree with you. There just needs to be more active listening. Uh, you've got two years for a reason at the end of the day. Um, Claire? Yeah, all of that. And um, being in the room, um, congratulations to the men that are in the room. It's not comfortable to be part of these conversations sometimes. I feel the same as a white person in the room talking about when conversations are being held about racism and um, what isn't my lived experience, but I, that I need to learn and um, respond to. So that's the first thing is respect for that. I think, um, and, and listening and learning, sharing power for the men who are in positions of, of power and responsibility. Uh, I think really um, uh, progressive men are doing that. And um, calling out sexism, you were talking about that. I think also just being open to different working styles and the more you diversify your workplace, the more there isn't just one way of doing things and that, that benefits everybody. It also benefits your bottom line, makes you more likely to be profitable and successful. Masses of evidence that diverse teams are, are the best teams. Um, so I would say there, there's plenty for men to be doing and, um, and some men are doing it um, and doing it in the workplace and doing it in their day to day lives, the way they are with their sisters, with their, with their, 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 their female friends or their mums, you know, like how they are being really respectful and fighting the, the Andrew Tatification of, of the world um, that we all have got to stand up to because the thing that there's so many reasons to, to be hopeful um, because there is change in the workplace happening all the time. But one of the things that does worry me is the evidence coming out that for the first time um, some young men are, are really being affected by what, how they're being targeted in social media and the messages they're getting about young women that, that are just misogynistic and, and risk-taking us backwards rather than what has been in the last decade, that progress of each generation being more progressive and aware about inequality and misogyny than the last so now is, if there ever was a time for us all to kind of rise up together to ensure that the, the, the changes that we have secured for women in the workplace and outside it are retained, it isn't the case that we're just going to keep rolling forward. We have to fight, not roll backwards as well at the same time. So we, we have to keep speaking out um, and men are obviously need to be leading that change. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm going to move on to our last set question. Um, just a reminder that we do have a Mentimeter and if you have a mobile phone or anything you just go into menti.com, put the code in and then type out your question and then I will get the questions from 
we'll see down at the front, and then we'll discuss those afterwards. So the last question I have is, uh, we have a lot of young women and men in the audience with us today, some of whom might be starting jo out jobs or, or careers. Do you have any tips or words of advice for young people who are just starting out the world of work? And I'll go with you first, Claire. Well, I love what you said, Carrie, which is very kind of, come on, go and do it. Um, I would also say alongside that, you might be a young woman who absolutely knows what you want to do um, and you want to be a chief exec or whatever it is you want to be. And there may be young women here who have not got a clue. I mean, I never had a clue. I just thought, I spent a lot of time in my 20s not having a clue. I worked in a pub, did admin. I was just a bit lost. And, and I would say, uh, again, for the, my experience of young women coming to us for coaching, that between 18 and 30 years, a lot can happen. And it's a time for experimenting, learning, trying something, making a terrible mistake, many mistakes. You know, and it is a windy path and everyone's journey is a bit different. So I think one of the things that I would have liked said to me a little bit more is just hold steady and try not to almost have horse blinkers on. Try not to compare yourself, which is very hard to um, other people around you because you've got your own journey and you're doing it in your own way, whatever that looks like to you. Yeah. Whatever your version of ambition is um, and whatever your values are, because that's going to be the most important way to get yourself happy is think about what actually, you know, makes you happy. Jack? I think we've spoken a lot this morning, uh, this afternoon, about the issues and things involved in in the workplace and in certain industries. So I think it's about being part of the change that we want to create. So if you're a young girl wanting to go into the construction industry, the manufacturing industry, get into a leadership session, as you say, do it and just kind of um, you know go for it. Don't let these stigmas or barriers in society put you off. You are entitled to be in those positions. And you should go for them. And I think you, what you'll find, there's loads of great organisations and resources. So if you do come into any roadblocks along the way or challenges, there are support um, networks out there and to seek them out as well. But I think there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful as well for the next generation coming through. This will hopefully be the next generation that we finally see equality in our boardroom. The next generation will hopefully see equality in pay. So there's a lot to be hopeful for as well. Definitely. And guys? Yeah, top tip. Yeah, go and do it. Don't let anybody tell you you can't. <laughs> Don't let anybody tell you it's not possible. It always is. But also, you know, if you go into your chosen career and it doesn't work out quite as you'd planned in those early days, do not beat yourself up, you know? I doubt, well, certainly Claire and I will have similar experiences. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I started out. I mean, crikey, I ended up working in a bank. You know, who wakes up in the morning, thinks they want to be a banker all their days? But... It was a career that did me really well, really well. I had a great career there. So, you know, if your path isn't quite right or needs adjusted, that's what life looks like. Don't sweat it too much. But in terms of doing what you want to do, if you do choose to go into an area that is perhaps more male-dominated, it can be challenging. The culture will be a bit different. And, you know, realistically, you should expect that. But equally... You're a rare commodity in that sector. There's not many of you. You can stand out, you know. So there are different ways of using that to your advantage. And sectors where women are less prevalent tend to be sectors that are keen to bring more women in because the argument is well accepted that diversity means better commercialisation and diversity is good for all of us. So, you know, there are advantages in there. Don't just be put off by the fact that there's nobody like you in there to start with. You go and be that person and encourage more to come in and be like you, you know, like your sister. There she is, knocking down barriers, you know? And, and don't always think that you have to be up there and full of courage. Courage is a quality that can quietly come and be built up over the years. You know, you don't always have to be, rah, look at me taking on the sector. There are different ways of doing it. Find your role models. Find the people out there that are doing things that you think, oh, my goodness, that's amazing. And just be more like them. It really sometimes is that simple, you know. I'm always a great admirer of women of courage. And one of my role models that you'll probably all have heard of is Michelle Obama. I think she is absolutely amazing. I think she's so courageous. And I think she has inspired so many women and girls on the planet. So, yeah, some days I wake up and just go, come on, Carrie, be a bit more Michelle today. And, and we've all got it in us to be like that and to follow our dreams and to give it our best shot. So you go for it. 
just following on from that, if you want a bit of inspiration, Michelle Obama's speech to the uh, convention, um, the, the Democrat convention, was a 20-minute speech in the first five minutes where she um, speaks is electrifying. And uh, she talks about her mum and um, how she, you know, set Obama up for the kind of success they had. So it's, yeah, it's a really inspiring listen. I guess the takeaway from that is to be a bit more like Michelle Obama. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so thank you so much for answering those questions. That was very kind of you. Um, we're now going to move... I would now like to invite the audience to participate in a discussion. Uh, we're going to be taking questions through Menti. If you would like to ask a question, please submit by using your phone by going to www.menti.com and typing in the code here. Um, if you're unable to use Menti, please signal a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament or Young Women's Movement team uh, who will identify... They're both sitting down here. Um, uh, who will give you post notes to write your questions on? So I have a couple of questions from the audience, um, but I have one myself that I would like to ask you first. So um, I obviously spend a lot of my time around incredibly inspirational women. Um, who was a woman that inspires you the most, and why? And I'll start with yourself, Claire, if that's okay. Well, I always find like choosing one person really, really hard. But I mean. What I was watching last night was Michelle Obama. I mean, that's the first person that comes to mind. And yesterday, um, she inspires me because she's broken through both the barriers about gender and race. And I think it's a difficult position to be a kind of um, first lady because you're seen as a sort of... You're not the person who's been democratically elected as the president. And she turned that into something that was the most powerful role that it could be and she and I, if you ever want to read her book it's it's a it's a brilliant read so um but I mean also I was inspired by people immediately around me I've got a fantastic woman who lives on my street who just looks after everybody she's a real campaigner for change you know sometimes it's the people who are in the spotlight who inspire you but sometimes it's someone who is doing it quite quietly she works in the local food bank um she is just always kind of there and really drives a lot of community change and uh she inspires me um so yeah i'd Lovely, probably thank you. put her up there with michelle obama go for it <laughs> <laughs> jack what about yourself I, I think that's such an amazing question um i think i've already mentioned it a bit but if i had to pick one person i'd probably pick my mom um so I said that already i think in watching her as I've kind of grown up I think she's incredibly inspiring and it's been amazing to see her kind of break down barriers and stigma I'd mentioned kind of she'd gone back to university when we'd kind of grown up and having the courage to do that and take the the courage to go back and work at night and during the day and um, to get that done was just amazing it was great to see her graduate and go into the new career she really enjoys that's lovely oh, I bet she'd be proud to be on this platform <laughs> well <done>. <laughs> <laughs> what about yourself Carrie um well I guess we work with a lot of women business owners, I think I said that at the start, um, and we have wrote a role model ambassador programme. So these are women from all across Scotland who run businesses of different sizes, different types, different sectors, different geographic locations. But what they've all got in common is they're really courageous, they're really resilient, and they are really inspiring people. So go and check them out. They're on the womensbusinesscentre.com under our inspiration section. It tells you a little bit about each of their stories. To access all the content, you might have to register as a business owner. I'm sure they're all going to be business owners one day, so just crack on, you know, and that way you'll be able to access all the stories and have a look and just see the different women all across Scotland who are doing amazing things in our local towns and cities. And, you know the entrepreneurial skills that they bring, the thinking, the change, the courage, is really amazing. It makes me really proud to be Scottish when I see what they're doing. That was lovely. It was a very nice, um, like, wholesome start to the Q&A, so I'm quite glad about that. So our first question is going to be, uh, what should we do to call out misogyny slash sexist behaviour and attitudes in our jobs in a way that is safe and not putting us at risk of being fired? Do you want to start, Carrie? Well, it's tricky, isn't it? There's the million dollar question. If only I could answer that, then maybe we could actually have that cultural change. You know, that's one of the sort of complexities of things, isn't it? So what can we do? We need to start having conversations like today. So that is one thing we can do. So we start to think about it and talk about it. 
We're not sending you off with neatly packaged up phrases and situations, are we? So, but we are thinking about it, we're talking about it, and we're acknowledging that it is a problem. Um, we can definitely improve our training. I think more training needs to incorporate discussions with colleagues about the workplace, about situations that either have arisen, slightly trickier, um, or could hypothetically arise, and what your reactions would be and discuss that as a group. And I have found that to be really highly effective. It is very tricky. We shouldn't underestimate that. It is tricky for women to articulate this. It is tricky for men as well to articulate that because we train both with the work that we do, but we absolutely need to start incorporating those conversations in all of our training at work and in places where we are, in schools as well. We need to start having these conversations. They're important. And if we keep having them regularly, it becomes less strange. People feel validated that they can talk about it, they can discuss it, and suddenly the discussion will start to shift from the hypothetical things to actually, oh, this happened the other day. How should we tackle it? And suddenly it feels like a safe space it feels like people are bought into it and you can start to have those conversations. So I'm sorry, there is no go and do this and that will make it easy. But actually, if we start having the conversations now, over time, this will be a much, much lesser issue and much less common. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I would like to go to yourself, Claire, next, if that's OK. Yeah, all of that. And I guess like quite a lot of companies now have got whistleblowing policies and, and defined routes for people to share concerns like that. And, um, and obviously, also, if you're in a reasonable company that's got HR, they're often a good place to go and knowing who your allies are. Um, but it, it certainly is a challenging thing to do. Um, but it is one of the ways in which people learn what's going on and it, it, and sometimes with the the, the kind of day-to-day -day microaggressions like I gave an example before of men just saying just calling it out in the moment or oh, I think someone's interrupted you there it's that kind of in the getting it in the you know nip of the bud sort of thing um do you want to come in Jack yeah I would, I would totally agree with that and I think it's about giving and it's creating a a better work environment for everybody but I think it's given people the confidence and skills to know when to call it out and how to call it out so you've kind of touched on better training mm -hmm. um, just to ensure that they have that but I think that's so important and so effective in the moment if it is just called out and it just completely puts it to rest so no I, would, I totally agree and kind of looking at it from someone with no first-hand experience of um, going through sexism in the workplace I know one of the things we've done in Dundee with Boolean is we've got an education app and you can go on and report an incident of Boolean anonymously and that's possibly something businesses could do if people didn't have the confidence to go and report it themselves. If they could do it anonymously on a work app or something like that, that's possibly something that would be effective. Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, it definitely comes with um, going to the right people and not losing your cool over it, I think, is definitely a, a major factor in that. So I'm going to move on to the next question, which is um, many young women want to get into politics slash business, but fear that the toxic atmosphere played out, uh, that there's a toxic atmosphere played out by social media. How can we nurture that and not scare, scare them off instead? Um, Carrie? Yeah. Um, well, we need to nurture it because we absolutely need more women in business and we need more women in politics as well. Um, social media kind of is what it is, isn't it? It has become very toxic. I think if you look at history, things, you know, disintegrate to a particular point, you hit rock bottom and it starts to come up. So let's hope that we are reaching rock bottom with social media because it's pretty awful. And actually, if it wants to remain as a commercial entity, I think it'll have to clean up its act and get to grips with many of the issues that are coming out. So let's hope that that gets resolved. But you know, it is possible to be in business and to be in politics and to park the social media. So speak to anybody that is in business or politics about how they deal with it. You know, it's deeply unpleasant. It shouldn't be happening. That is 100% evident. But there are tactics you can, you know, employ to, to deal with it. And it's also important to say, I think especially in politics, 
We work with a lot of politicians and the issue of, of greater equality is something that unites everybody, I would say. So despite the appearance that sometimes politics is very toxic on the, the surface and can be very tribal, behind the scenes, people can be really collaborative, particularly on issues that they care about. And we certainly see a lot of cross-party support, all parties coming together with some of the work that we do. I've had a lot of personal support from individual politicians that make a big difference to my work. And often that's why people go into politics, right? It's to make a difference. It is to make a difference. Now, I hold my hand up to them. It is a tricky business. I'm not sure that I could tow a party line all the time, you know? I'm not necessarily wired like that. But maybe, maybe it could be trained in to more of us. But that aspiration to make a difference, don't give up on that. Consider politics, consider business, because you can make a change, you can make a difference, you can be that person. So, Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to come to yourself, Jack, next, if that was okay. Yeah, I think the important thing to say is don't let social media put you off if you want a career in business or politics. Don't let that put you off. It's something that's become really prominent over the last probably 10 years or so. I think we're all having to adapt and deal with it. I know it's something we look at quite a lot in the Scottish Youth Parliament and particularly with us having slightly more public profiles than other young people. It's something we get um, training on it and support. So if you do get any abusive messages, um, you've kind of got that support network there, which is really good, particularly if you are a young person entering these sorts of industries. Um, but I think it's about having balances for yourself. So ensuring that you're not looking at all the comments on Twitter, Instagram, all the time and you're creating limits for yourself um, and I would say possibly especially not to look at the comments and things like that um, but that's about setting your own personal boundaries and things but I think there's a, a broader point like you said about ensuring that social media companies do improve um, their the monitoring of their content and ensuring that it is more appropriate for the whole audience and that's hopefully something that will improve over the coming years. Definitely thank you very much and yourself Claire. Yeah, I would add that when you get out of the online world, which is often very toxic, and you get in the real world, you can find your networks in the same way that you do at school. You find your allies. You navigate through quite a difficult world of school to find your people that, you, that, that make you feel good about yourself and who you feel safe with. And you, and you do that in, in workplaces and in politics too. And that one of the things about being in a minority is that there's often a lot of solidarity. And I find as the women chief exec, one of the best things about becoming, I'm a relatively new chief exec, still learning all the time, is meeting other women chief execs who were just, I met with Jenny last night from the Young Women's Movement and it is inspiring and there's so much support and learning that comes from that. And that's, uh, there's also brilliant organisations out there for women there. In, in politics, there's 5050 Parliament, Electa, organisations that are there to network um, women who would like to get into Parliament or, or are in Parliament. In a few weeks' time, the Fawcett Society in England is running a caucus for new women MPs. Um, and uh, in, in, the, in, you know, in employment, there's women in construction, there's women in tech. Every sector that is male, predominantly male, there are these networked organisations that are there to champion you. So when you are thinking about what kind of career you want, this is where um, being online really is your friend and you can Google and find the organisations that are going to support you. And there are some brilliant ones out there. So um, there's, it, there's a lot of resource um, when, you, when you know where you want to head. Um, it possibly is worth saying as well, Alana, before we move on, that if you are a young person in the room thinking about getting into politics and uh, activism, that the Scottish Youth Parliament's a good place to start. We've yeah, kind of definitely. gone over that. <laughs> it is the most, or one of the most diverse parliaments in the world. I think it's got... Um, 53% of members identify as female. So it is really diverse and it's got the support and training there. So if it is something you're thinking about, do get involved. Loads of opportunities in it. Um, but just felt weird to say that before we moved on. Yeah, definitely. Scottish Youth Parliament, especially if you're a young woman, um, is such a great place to start. Um, I would be nowhere near as confident as I am today if it wasn't for the Scottish Youth Parliament and all of the amazing... I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the Scottish Youth Parliament. Um, and I've been given so many amazing opportunities through them. And there's such a, a strong cohort of women who will just lift each other up. And it's, it's amazing, honestly. Um, you've made me lose my train of thought. Hold on, give me a minute. <laughs> um, 
How would you recommend you build your confidence if you want to enter a male-dominated industry? Find a network of women. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Find a network of women. I mean, like, like, like we say, they are all there, actually. And it really has become a, a, a growing tactic. It is really helpful. And speak to other, speak to other women um, in that industry. It's actually, it's great for so many so many things it's great for your personal development it's great for your career um i mean don't don't isolate yourself just there either it is important to talk to your male colleagues as well because that's where you're working um but certainly to to have that group of other people who know how you feel you know regardless of what the situation is is always a great tactic in life you know um so not just from a sort of gender perspective you know i am the mother of uh, twin boys and my goodness when they came along the only other people that understood were other mothers of twins you know so you know find your find your people that are going through the same kind of experience as you because that's really really important but particularly in those industries Def sorry definitely um jack do you want to go on yeah i think just adding on kind of what you'd spoken about there we've spoken a lot about the negative side of social media but I suppose the advancements in technology and improvements in social media mean that if there's not a huge number of women in a particular industry, you have got the opportunity to connect with people who may be in a completely different part of the world and keep in touch with them and share stories and experiences. So there is a positive side to social media as well, though we've discussed a lot of the negatives. Definitely. Um, just before you come in, Claire, I would also like to chime in on this. I feel like there needs to be a, a slight level of self-confidence within yourself as well. Obviously, it would be the same if... Like, well, not the same, but it would be similar if you were going into a female-dominated industry, Jack, where you just kind of have to have to have that kind of, this is what I want to do, and this is how I'm going to do it, and I'm not going to let anybody else tell me what I'm going to do, because that's purely coming off of what my little sister's like. She's so headstrong, she's so, like, she never listened to anyone, she'll always just do what she wants, and, like, that's such a good way to be, especially if you're, in, if you're going into a male-dominated industry, because you do need to have thick skin, I think, as well. Um, but yeah, definitely. Claire, if you want to come in. Sorry, I went on a tangent there. No, absolutely right. And that, they're just, I would just add to that, there was a lovely phrase once said to me, which is that courage is a muscle and it grows the more you use it. And I've found that to be true. Um, so work that muscle when you can. <laughs> yeah. And so can I, can I just say as well, we often perceive people to have loads of confidence and it's not always the case you know I remember working with a group of very senior women in Scotland in many ways some of them are running the the country at the top of their their industries and we were holding this particular um, bit of training in a building that didn't really have any signage it looked very posh and contemporary and we were having coffee and everybody was going oh I didn't, I didn't know if I was in the right place. I didn't know if it was the right building, you know. Gosh, yeah, I mean, there's no signage. We weren't sure we were in the right place. And I'm thinking, so these are the most senior women in the country. Everybody feels a bit odd and a bit unconfident in certain situations. And you're 100% right, Claire. Courage is a muscle. You make sure you use it every single day. I love that phrase. I'm going to start using that more, I think. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to go on to the next question. So um, reaching senior leadership roles for women can be hard. Getting a seat at the table is just the start. It's, been, it's being heard at the table that really counts. How can we push for this? I love this question. So if anybody wants to go first. Well, I kick off. Go on. So you're right. That is absolutely the case. But do not knock the fact that you've got to the table. OK, do not knock the fact you've got to the table. I can remember once being in a board um, and as a woman, it was, it was my job. I was asked to take the minutes. And, you know, I did have a sort of quiet inner sigh going, oh, God, really, you know? But actually, I gained my voice by taking the minutes. I can't say that I always took the minutes and reflected what was actually said at that <laughs> meeting. I considered what I wanted to get out of that meeting personally and drew up the minutes accordingly. So, you know, don't knock the fact that you may not have the loudest voice at that table. Consider how you can gain influence and get what you want. And that is a different thing. Um, that is not to say you shouldn't have a voice. It is really infuriating. And it is a gendered sort of um, 
uh, concept that, that men will talk over you. You know, that, that is often the case with women. Or you'll be sitting there and nobody seems to acknowledge your great point until the man beside you says it and then it's suddenly a great point, you know. Try not, when, when you're in those cultural situations, try not to get too hung up on those things that are happening around you. Try and keep focused on the thing you want to get out of the meeting. And ultimately, keeping focused on achieving what you want will in some ways actually help you change the dynamic of the meeting. And never forget as well that what happens in the meeting is not necessarily what comes to pass. Often it is the conversations out with the meeting in the boardroom that influence what actually happens. So bear that in mind too. There are many ways to skin the proverbial cat. <laughs> Be adept at them all. I'll go to yourself now, Claire, if that's okay. Yeah, I don't know whether I've got much to add to that, except to say I think in the in the in the world where we were less hybrid and it was in you were in the room, it is a bit easier then, I think, because you can like get to know the chair, you can know who's taking the minutes, you could even have a look at the minutes before they go out, you can speak to people before and after the meeting. So I would encourage people as much as possible where you can go into the workplace for some of those meetings. I think you can be more influential in person than a hybrid um, so I, I, if it's an important meeting and you've got a choice to be there I get myself there um, so I think online world is a is a is a different a different thing I think the other thing is when you get to the a, an influential table is about how you're putting your hand out to pull other young women and women into the room because a lot of this is about um, representation it's not everything it's obviously it's about culture and not just about numbers but the more women are in the room the more people feel able to speak um, and uh, and if you ever get to be a chair, you're doing a brilliant job today. Uh, that is a very powerful role. So you've got an opportunity then to really model how to distribute power around a room and make sure that really good chairs do go around and say, oh, I haven't heard from you yet. What is it that you would like to say on this? And, and that's what good chairing is about. So there's an opportunity then um, to, to, to mix things up a little bit. Definitely. Um, do you have anything to say to yourself, Jack? I was just going to add that um, kind of some of the, the Scottish Youth Parliament's Young Women Empowerment Group's experiences, and they'd spoken just in August about, uh, with SYP, they found that males would dominate discussions, they'd talk down to female MSYPs, and they wouldn't make space for them to participate in wider discussions. So it's something that even young people are picking up on in this day and age. But I think, um, I'll just reflect on some of the discussions we've, we'd had earlier, saying that in the vast majority of these big companies, it's men that are at the top of the companies. So I think it's important getting that message across that you talked about earlier about just listening and that men do need to listen in the meetings. And I think that's really important. And because men are at the top, it's about getting that culture shift while we wait for women to come up and take these yeah. high positions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just need some more Jack for the world. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, I, I guess, I, again, what we're going on for about listening, listening is great, but active listening and acting upon what you're hearing as well is such a huge role because you can sit here and listen to us speak today, but you might go away and just completely forget about it. But in the time you were listening, I think active, there's a difference between listening and active listening. That's basically what I'm trying to say. So the next question is, um, I work in the tech industry and have worked with some fantastic allies, both men and women. Tackling blatant sexism in the workplace has, become, has come a long way. How do we now tackle the unconscious bias? Oh, I go. Yes. I don't, I don't believe it's unconscious. <laughs> I believe it's very conscious bias. I think it's quite hard to say it is completely unconscious in this day and age. However, you know, in all seriousness, you know, I do take the point that people often do things without fully appreciating the whole ripple effect or consequences of what they've just done and said. So to that extent, you know, there is, there is something to be tackled. I just don't agree that it is unconscious. They're just not thinking as fully as they should as leaders in the workplace about um, what they're doing and saying. So how do we, how do we tackle it and, and make it better? I think sometimes, you know, it comes back to, it depends on your culture as to how you tackle it. You know, too many people think you have to be a vert and go, well, I just don't agree with that, you know, and you're right out there challenging. And that is one tactic that can be used quite effectively sometimes by people. 
Um, often you need to have the hide of a rhinoceros develop to employ that tactic, um, and that comes over time, though. Um, but if you're not as comfortable with that sort of tactic, then, you know, I think you need to sometimes say to people, mm, yeah, not sure about that. Maybe I want to go away and have a think about that. Or mm, could we maybe just pick up after this meeting? I'm, I'm just not sure about some of these proposals. There are different ways of diffusing things in different circumstances and giving yourself the legitimacy perhaps on a one-on-one, -on -one, for example, to, to have your point heard or to make your point or to, to change some of these situations in which um, bias comes to play um, and you minimise it. And the other way, actually, is to use the values of your organisation to bring to bear. All organisations have values. Some are much better at others than adhering to them. So, you know, a really easy tactic to go is... Mm, Oh, we were speaking about that. I wonder, how, do, how does that match up with our X, Y, Z value over here, which will usually say something about gender equality or, or, or whatever. That's a really easy way to sort of hold it up into the spotlight and go, oh, look, you know, big gap between what you're saying effectively and what our values say over here. So there's a few different ways to think about in terms of how you can tackle those. Definitely. Thank you very much. Uh, Jack? I think one of the new aspects of unconscious bias that I've been reading about recently was AI. And I think one of the big tech companies had used AI as part of their recruitment. And it was to create a short list of applicants um, that had applied. And the AI system had kind of gone through, I think, like the past 30 years of uh, candidates that hired and kind of looked at trends and what was successful, what wasn't. And they computer picked up on the fact that it was men that were hired more than women and the computer then started to put male candidates above female candidates and I think it's just important that we're looking because you can possibly think oh AI that'll be fair it's a, a computer deciding it but they these systems are still picking up on these unconscious bias that we've put into the systems so it's just an interesting point there to make about the the computer systems and it's something to be aware of going forward that they're not flawless either, and they have got these uh, problems built into them as well. <coughs> That's yeah. really, really interesting. I didn't know that. That's really, really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm just building on, on, on that. When we were doing some anti-racism training in my workplace, the trainer said to us, look, there's a, there's a danger that people treat racism like it's the shark. And we can go, oh, we know that's a racist comment. That you, you're not allowed to say that. That is inappropriate. But it's not the shark. It's the water, the whole system is anti-racist and it needs to be anti-racist and that is true for sexism so if you're in a workplace where you think the sharks are being called out that's that's that gets you some of the way there but it is the water it's the whole system that we're swimming in and ai is sucking up that water and is reflecting it back to us and is and is now getting baked into recruitment and it, which i think is super dangerous um, on grounds of race and and gender so i think the only way to manage that whole water uh, is to keep it's a day-to-day -day thing around um education about calling it out around individual acts of courage and allyship it's the whole it's the whole piece as well as as spotting the shark um uh but i i think that there's a lot to like we're saying there's a lot to celebrate but um in those workplaces where you feel like in some ways, there's not overt acts of sexism. You're still, you're still sucking up a lot of this sense about what it is to be powerful. Are you good enough? Um, how do you get success in those workplaces? It's not, it's not easy. I think your, your suggestions are, are right, Carrie, there. And, and, um, and you're right, Jack, about we shouldn't have a panel like Women in the Workplace where we're not talking about AI and how that's going to drive change in the next decade and how we've got to get on top of that if we want to stay... Um, with progressive and keep the pace of change going. Definitely, because we are becoming a more digital society and in, in the next five, ten years, we're going to be relying more and more on computers and more and more on AI and things like that. Even within, like, post-COVID, we're still relying heavily on teams. Well, for us, it's for teams anyway, I don't know about yourselves. But we're still relying on these resources to, for us to do what we do in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so uh, recognising these patterns, that I, think that I, I can't believe how eye-opening that is to me. Because obviously you kind of just assume, oh, it, it'll be it's an it, it'll be won't, it'll be a level playing field because it won't know the difference between a man and a woman. But it obviously goes off past data, so yeah. there's that. 
which is I, it's that's boggled my mind actually. <laughs> um, so can I, can I, can yeah, go for it very quickly because this was about the tech sector. The tech sector does have a really interesting dynamic because it's known sometimes for people that have what's called a bit of a god complex, and that means they're always right. They are, you know, really hot developers, and they are really right, and they've developed this. And it can be very difficult if you come smack bang up against that if you're working in a project. So the project that delivered that fundamentally flawed piece of AI would have been a golden project within whatever organisation was delivering it. There probably wouldn't be scope for very much dissent round about that because it was such a fantastic spot on great tech project. Now, you know, boom. <laughs> oh, look, it wasn't quite so great and fine but I think you do have to cut yourself a bit of slack there will be situations as with such golden projects that occur in all workplaces where actually you just have to bide your time that is the tactic sometimes and um, it's not great but it is the reality of the situation but you know bide your time wait till it comes out wait until oh god look it's not the emperor's new clothes it's a naked man in the street Boom, that's when to go in with your point and go, let's not do that again and let's learn a lesson. So, you know, sometimes, yeah, we, we have to work to the reality that we're in. Definitely. Um, so I'm going to move on to our last uh, two questions. I do have a couple of other questions here that I've not managed to get through today. So if it would be okay, I can send them to you guys and you can get back to us and publish it or whatever, just so that everybody gets uh, the chance to hear what they want to hear. Um, so, since we're in Parliament, uh, what role do you think politicians in creating change uh, have in creating change regarding sexism in the workplace? Do you want to go first? What role do politicians have? Well, one of the things that's really exciting about the new um, Labour government that we have is that they have got a really um, big agenda for changing uh, things in the workplace from um, tackling gender pay gap reporting and making sure that people have are required to do action plans on the back of not just getting the data and saying how bad it is, but actually um, tackling that. Women are more likely to be in insecure work than young men, and they're going to be banning exploitative zero-hours contracts, which I think is really good news. Um, we're getting stronger union recognition, which when we are talking before about tackling sexism in the workplace, one of the, if you've got a union in your workplace, they can be an ally for you. And, and there's also, thank goodness, going to be a change to make sure that the minimum wage um, it goes down in age so that you get it when you're 18 because it's not cheaper to live when you're 18. I thought it was an outrage that 18, 19 year olds get less money than 20, 21 year olds. I'm delighted to see that being changed and that the minimum wage is going to increase more with the cost of living with a low pay commission looking at that. So there is a lot of change coming that is going to make the workplace better for all workers, particularly for low paid workers and particularly for women. So I think... Um, it's going to show, show us all, I think, how, how much politics can make a difference to our working lives. Definitely. Um, Jack? Yeah, I totally agree with everything you've said there. Um, I think the role of politicians is to raise awareness and take actions on um, these issues. One of the things I had done last year was raise awareness about the recent rise in shop worker uh, and re hospitality worker abuse since the pandemic. And I put a motion forward at the Scottish Parliament's national sitting last year, and it was passed by the membership, and that's become official SYP policy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so since the pandemic, there's been a huge rise in abuse to these, wor abuse to these workers. But in that industry, it's dominated by women and young people. So that's unproportionately th those groups getting that level of abuse. And... So I think it's really important that we do tackle that issue. I think in the House of Commons said um, more than one in 10 women work in retail. So it's a huge proportion um, of women that are working in that industry. And if it's a young woman, it's often the first job they've had. It's, and it's really daunting to um, suffer verbal or physical abuse and it stays with them for a very long time. So it'd be really good to see some action on that. And I'll be continuing my work um, on that project to see some action on it and hopefully they start to get um, get some action on it. But yeah, just wanted to raise awareness about that particular issue. And I think politicians do have a role in raising awareness and taking action on these issues. And the Scottish Parliament did pass particular legislation in relation to that in 2021. So they are kind of using their responsibility wisely there. Great. Thank you. Very quickly, two things to say. Uh, firstly, um, 
definitely follow what Jack has done. Politicians work for you, remember that. It is your legitimate right to tell them of things you are saying that you would like to see changed and to ask them if they're going to support that change or what they're going to do about it. Equally, your legitimate right to inform them of your experiences if they have been poor and ask them to work with you on policy change and making a difference. That's really important. There is not enough awareness of that. That is how MPs and MSPs come to be informed. You know, they need you as their constituents to tell them what is working and what is not working in order for them to make a change with the legislation that they bring to bear. And the other thing I would say about the role of politicians is really um, make sure your own house is in order first. Make sure that you are actually taking a leadership role in this and you are eradicating sexism from your workplace, your immediate office, but also the wider halls in which you inhabit. That is really important and we're hearing too much um, coming out that there is still work to be done in these places. These are our leaders, our elected representatives. We shouldn't be hearing or seeing of these instances. So take a leadership role um, and make sure that we can look to these democratic institutions as beacons of leadership and example. Definitely, that was something I was going to mention is um, it's all fine and well advocating for um, no sexism in the workplace and things like that, but if your own organisation is full of uh, sexist allegations and things like that, then how can we be sure that you're doing what we're asking you to, I suppose? Um, I think that's all the time we've got for questions, I'm afraid. Um, we do have a couple of them left. I'm going to send them out to each of you and then we can get them back and then send them out on social media and things like that if anyone else is interested. Uh, thank you all for your contribution to the event. Before we close, I would like to give each of our panellists one minute to sum up, sum up our discussion today. So go up to yourself, Claire. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'd sum up by saying change is possible. And um, we've seen a lot of changes and there is much more to be done. Um, given who we have in the audience, I just want to say again to the young women in the audience, um, I really hope that you see your part of the change and that you can achieve what you want in the next few years, in, the in your 20s, as you go into this next decade of your life. Um, there is a lot, a lot that you can do. And that I think that working with Jacks in the world and the, and the male allies, I hope that we can all come together to kind of keep the pace of change up and that the... Um, and I guess, as we've been saying, that there is a lot of changes coming down the track in legislation that's going to affect the whole of the UK. Um, and, and we'll start, I hope, seeing the sexism in the workplace that has been going on for decades um, will we'll, we'll get un, unwound. Um, and I think um, maybe I should just stop there because I'll let Jack and Carrie say a little bit more. I think we've covered a lot of topics in a short space of time. Definitely, yeah. um, Carrie, do you want to go first? Thanks for all your great questions and for coming here today because that is actually what, what starts change, isn't it? Um, I thought your questions were great, really insightful, really well informed. I think, sadly, we don't have all the answers or solutions yet, but we're definitely working on that. And we have changed a lot in the intervening years and take a lot of hope for that. And I hope you're really inspired by the work of the Scottish Youth Parliament. And I think it is really important to have young people in places like this. And I'm really heartened by the fact that we've had that discussion today. So thank you for that. Uh, one thing I would like to say is, um, I love to see the front row seats full. So please, the next time you're coming into a discussion like this, we're holding it for you. We're here because we see you as the change makers and the leaders of the future. And these are important issues to talk about. So please come and take your seat at the front. That's a big part of confidence and belonging and enacting it. And it's a simple thing you can do every time. I meet the women I work with when we go to some big um, entrepreneurial, rather male dominated sometimes, arguably, conferences. I make them all come and sit at the front <laughs> so that they know that we're here. So please remember your places at the front. Take your seats accordingly. Great. Thank you very much. And Jack? Yeah, I think it's been a really interesting uh, conversation we've had today. 
I think it's really important to have these sorts of conversations about the issues women are experiencing in the workplace and ensuring that everybody's involved in those discussions. I think my biggest takeaway will be probably that men need to stop talking in, in these rooms and listen to, to women's issues. I think that was a really good way you put it. Um, but I am optimistic after discussion today that we are going to see progress and things are going to get better. Hopefully we will start to see more women in construction, manufacturing, law, engineering, more opportunities for young women to go into management roles and fair pay, finally. But I think the biggest words of wisdom you'd given was that courage is a muscle, and that's what I'll be taking away from today. I should say, not my words of wisdom. Well, I'm <laughs> on, but absolutely. You pass it on. <laughs> that's definitely a phrase I will be taking yeah, along to, alongside me today. So um, we must end there. I would like to thank you all for coming along today and for making such a big contribution. I'd also like to thank our panel, uh, Claire Rounder, Carolyn Curry, and Jack Anderson, for their insightful discussions of and our partners at the Young Women's Movement and the Scottish Youth Parliament. If you would like to know more about the work our panellists are doing, then you can check out their websites. Uh, can I also remind you to fill out the survey you will have received automatically if you've booked via Eventbrite, or we have a few paper copies of